glad I'm a child of the King. There's only way to be a child of the King, and that's through the new birth. When you're born the first time, you're born into a condemned race. That condemned race is the human race. Those born after Adam. As in Adam all die, the Scriptures say. Uh, but when we're born again, we're born of God. We're born into His family. And we become joint heirs together with Jesus Christ. And become a child of the King. So if you're sitting here today, saved by the grace of God, you are a king. You are a priest. Isn't that a wonderful and marvelous thing to think about? Amen. You're something else in Christ. I mean, without Christ, we're nothing. We're wretches. But in Christ Jesus, we are kings. I'm looking there at King Rick. Just sung that song. Amen. Amen. I'm looking back there at Queen Courtney back there. King Donald back there in the back. You go by Donald or Don, brother. Don. Bro. King Don back there. Going to baptize him here at the wild. But uh, praise the Lord to be a part of this. And one of these days, Jesus Christ is going to come back. He promised He would. And the Bible's very clear that we will rule and reign with Christ Jesus. That means He'll be the King of kings and we'll reign under Him. And that'll be a spectacular thing, folks. But anyways, let's take our Bibles uh, this morning and turn to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to preach to you a sermon I've entitled, God Will Cut You Down. God Will Cut You Down. Alright. Daniel chapter 4. I'm going to read there, verse 10. It says, And thus were the visions of my head when I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and the height thereof was great. And the tree grew and was strong, and the height thereof reached into the heavens, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. And the leaves thereof were fair, and the fruit thereof much. And in it was the meat for all, and the beasts of the field had shadow under it, and the fowls of the heavens dwelt in the bows thereof. And all flesh was fed of it, and I saw in the visions of my head upon my bed, and behold, a watcher. A holy one came down from heaven and cried aloud and said, Thus hew down the tree and cut off his branches, shake off his leaves and scatter his fruit and let the beast get away from under it and the fowls from his branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and his roots in the earth, even a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field and let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let the portion, his portion be with the beast of the gra grass of the earth. And let his heart be changed from a man's, and let a beast's heart be given unto him. And let seven times pass over him. This matter is by the decree of the watchers, and the demand of the word of the holy ones, uh, that the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will, and setteth up over it the basest of men. Now look at verse 28. It says, And all this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar, and the end of the twelve months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. And the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty, while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, of the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen. Seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whosoever he will. And the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as the oxen. 
And his body was wet with the dew of heaven, and his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him that liveth forever and ever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and whose kingdom is from generation to generation. Now let's pray before we get started. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd be with me as I stand before your congregation this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to preach in your strength and in your power. Lord, I dare not trust in my study. I dare not trust in my education. Lord, I want to put my trust totally upon you today to lead me in what I should say. And Lord, I pray that my words will not be idle words. I pray that you would take the words spoken uh, from your man here this morning and, uh, and, and touch the hearts of each person here. Lord, if there's someone here who needs to be saved, I pray that those words would reach their heart and show them their great need and they'd be saved this very morning. But Lord, I pray also for those who are saved, I pray that you'd help this also to be a word of warning for us. Not to be lifted up with pride, but help us always to humble ourselves under your mighty hand. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Now let me tell you a little bit about King Nebuchadnezzar. He's the one who had this dream about this gigantic tree. And of course he finds out that that tree represents him. His kingdom had grown like a tree. It says in his dream that the tree went up into the heavens. And so Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom was spread throughout all the world. It was a great kingdom. He was a warrior king. And I tell you what, you were in trouble if you had a nation and you heard that Nebuchadnezzar's war machine was rolling your way. I mean, it was the greatest kingdom of that day. Now last week we spoke of Solomon's kingdom. Now Solomon's kingdom was the greatest probably kingdom that's ever been upon the face of the earth. But I tell you what, probably a close second would be Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom. I mean, he had great riches in his kingdom too. He had an image of gold that he set up that was 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. Now that's a gigantic golden image, isn't it? Now I don't know if it was pure gold. I'm talking about solid gold. If it was solid gold, it was between 400 and 500 pounds of gold. That's a lot of gold, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to have that gold? And maybe it was just coated in gold. But anyways, I tell you what, that was a, a great wealth, wealthy thing that he set up. Uh, also, he uh, had tiled walls uh, that were really well known. It, it is Ishtar Gate. Uh, many people still want to go and see replicas of that Ishtar Gate. It's made out of this blue stone. I was going to try to pronounce how you say it, but lapis lazuli, I can't even say it right. But anyways, uh, well, it was spectacular. Uh, it had that and it had gold. Also, there was the Hanging Gardens. And the, the Hanging Gardens was one of the seven wonders of the world at one time. Uh, that's to tell you how great this kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar's was. He had uh, many relationships as well as riches. Uh, he had uh, some of the smartest men in his kingdom. They were called astrologers and magicians, but they uh, were uh, men of great learning and mathematics. Uh, out of these uh, men are probably where those three magi came from uh, when the star appeared in the east. It was uh, this same group of people from Babylon, these astrologers. He also knew Daniel and the three Hebrew children. He's the one who threw the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. Y'all remember that? And he said, uh, I threw three in there. How come there's four walking around? And that fourth one's like the Son of God. So that's the same Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, he, was, uh, he had some revelations that were uh, amazing. Uh, he had a dream before this one. I believe it was before this one. But anyways, he, the Lord gave him a dream. And he didn't, know, he didn't remember the dream. And, and so he didn't know the interpretation of it. So he asked his astrologers, I want you to tell me what the dream was I had. And then tell me the interpretation of it. Now, that would be a hard thing to do, wouldn't it? I mean, they could have made something up if they knew what the dream was. And of course, they didn't know. So King Nebuchadnezzar says, I'm going to cut uh, everybody into pieces uh, that is of my wise men. If you don't tell me what this dream is, 
and the interpretation of it. And they were all nervous, but Daniel, he sought the Lord's face. And then God give uh, the, the, the meaning of that dream as well as the dream itself to Daniel. And this was the dream he had. In his dream he saw a gigantic image. And this image represented the times of the Gentiles. It would represent every kingdom that would follow after Nebuchadnezzar's reign up till the time of the Antichrist. And up to the time of the Lord Jesus Christ Himself sitting on that eternal throne. In this dream he saw a head of gold. And Daniel said, the Lord has revealed to me that that head of gold that you saw on that image, Nebuchadnezzar, was you and your kingdom. Yeah, gold is the most precious there of the metals. He was the greatest of these kingdoms. But then the, the chest was made of silver. Daniel said the Lord's interpretation is that silver is the Medes and the Persians who will come. And then the belly of brass, that would be the Assyrian Empire. And then the feet of iron would be the Roman Empire that would come later. The interesting thing is there was another kingdom there of men that has not come to pass yet, even as today. The toes were made of iron and clay. The feet. That is some kind of a, a kingdom that is to come. Uh, many people believe it to be the revived Roman Empire. And I'm one of those people. But anyways, it will be a, a ten nation confederation in the last days. So he saw all the kingdoms that would come to pass. Revealed to Nebuchadnezzar. But that greatest of all kingdoms was pictured as a rock that was hewn out without hands out of the side of the mountain, become, uh, started rolling down the mountainside, and it got bigger and bigger, and it crushed uh, the feet of that, uh, that image, and it all fell into dust. And then that rock which smote that image in its feet and turned it into dust began to grow and expand and filled the whole earth, and that is the kingdom of God, folks. That's picturing the day that we see in Revelation chapter 19 when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in power and glory and crushes the Antichrist and He sets up a kingdom that is from everlasting to everlasting. I'm going to be in that kingdom. That's the kind of revelation. This man had a spectacular life. But the problem is he not only was rich and he had relationships with some of the people of God... And he had some revelations from God, but he, but he fell into reveling in his own glory. Uh, chapter 4, verse 30, listen to what. He starts getting built up with pride, and this is what he says. And the king spake and said, Is this not great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by, my, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Do you notice the pronouns there? He says, I... My, my, my. He says, my. Um, he says, I've built this. I did all this. He says, my power is how I did it. He says, by my majesty, I did it. Now that sounds a little bit familiar to me. Someone who likes to use the words I and my. Sounds like this generation, don't it? Uh, everything's always about me and my. But it also reminds me of Lucifer. Over in Isaiah chapter 14, listen to what Lucifer says. This is the devil before he fell from heaven. Uh, when, he was a, uh, when he was contemplating rebelling against God. He says there in Isaiah 14 verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into the heavens. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell in the sides of the pit. He said, I, I, I too, didn't he? But I got news for when you start saying, I and my... And start thinking yourself to be high and mighty. God is about to cut you down. And that's exactly what it says in Isaiah 14. He says thou shalt be cut down. Thou shalt be brought down to hell in the sides of the pit. God does not put up with pride. 
I think about the predecessor of King Nebuchadnezzar. There was a man supposed that founded uh, Babylon was Nimrod. Nimrod is the one who said to the people, nothing will be impossible for us and started to build that tower up to the heavens. I was thinking about that tower to the heavens the other day. The Bible doesn't really tell why he wanted to build that. Some folks thought he was trying to build up in the heavens so he could walk up into heaven. Other people think it's unto the heavens that he was wanting to worship the heavens. Unto the heavens. They think it would be a ziggurat, a flat top a pyramid. But I was thinking the other day, and I don't have any scriptural proof for this, but I thought maybe he built this thing to, to avoid another flood. I mean, God had promised he had not flood the earth again, but it wasn't too long before that the earth was flooded. So he built this thing high. I don't know. But anyways, uh, his claim was what was so uh, blasphemous there. Let's make a name for ourselves. Nothing will be impossible for us. See that pride. So what did God do? He separated the people there. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I told you about how he saw the, uh, the nations that would come in that image of gold, a gold head, the silver chest, the, the bronze belly, the iron legs, and the iron and clay feet. How he saw that, uh, saw all the images. And it was explained to him by Daniel that those were coming kingdoms. You know what? Nebuchadnezzar did in response. He built that golden image that was 90 feet tall and 90 feet wide and it was made all out of gold, right? Which kingdom represented Nebuchadnezzar according to what I just said? The gold head? He made the whole image gold. You see what he was doing right there? He's a very prideful man. My kingdom ain't going in. It's not only going to be the head, it's going to be all the way down to the toes. And uh, you all know the story. He wanted everybody to worship that image too. He wanted them to worship Him. At a certain time of day. And if they weren't going to do it, He's going to kill them. That's pride, folks. He would have done him well to read the, the Hebrews Proverbs there in Proverbs 16, 18 where it said, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, as he strings these pronouns together, I, I, my, my, God is not pleased. And by the way, God is not pleased with our pride either. Amen. So he was punished for it. In verses 31 through 30, we read about uh, how he was going to be punished. His tree that represented him in that dream went all the way up to the heavens. But God said, I'm going to cut it down. I'm going to make it a stump. You're going to go from a tree that goes up in the heavens and just to a lowly stump. And his reign was taken from him. He was cut down to a stump. If you'll read verse 31, God said, The kingdom is departed from thee. And right then, God jerked the mat right out from under his feet. Now, Daniel understood this, that God's in control of kingdoms. God sets them up. God tears them down. Now, in fact, the Bible says the nations of the earth are like dust in a balance to him. Amen. Amen. But Daniel said in chapter 2 when, he got, uh, when God revealed the secret of that dream uh, of that image that represented all the Gentile uh, kingdoms he said uh, and uh, God changeth the times and the seasons and removeth kings and setteth them up. Now what is the reason God cuts him down? Well we see that in verse 32. That he would know the most high ruleth in the kingdoms of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. God's in control. Now verse 33. It says the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men and he did eat grass as an oxen. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven until his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Like the tree in the dream. He's been cut down. He's lost his mind. He's out in the wilderness. God showed him uh, who is in control and it was not him. 
It was not I and my anymore. It was Him. Amen. And then we get to the proclamation. When He comes back to Himself after the time has been fulfilled, He recognizes His error and He gives glory to God. He blesses the Lord who is in control and sets up kings and tears them down. He recites this realization to others and He has it even written down. It even ends up in the Word of God that God is in control. Now that was a history lesson and an introduction. Now what I want to do is to apply this to you. What does this have to do with you? Now the Bible is very clear in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, and instruction in righteousness. That means that of these historical events that I just told you about in the book of Daniel apply to you. They really happened, but they apply to you. They apply to you. Now, Let's look at the pronouns here for just a moment. Many people today have a problem with their pronouns just like Nebuchadnezzar did. Many people today have an I problem like King Nebuchadnezzar did. Now when I say I problem, I'm not talking about I problem as in I've got to put these dumb reading glasses on. Not E-Y-E -E problem. I'm talking about a letter I in parentheses problem. Most people today have an I problem, especially when it comes to salvation. Some folks think that they're good enough to save themselves. They say, I am a good person, therefore I will get into heaven. I tell you what, you've fallen into the same snare as King Nebuchadnezzar fell. You have fallen into the same snare uh, that, uh, that a Lucifer fell into. You're prideful enough to think that you're good enough to get into heaven? I'm a good person. Well, the problem is you're measuring yourself by a faulty standard. You're measuring yourself by other sinful, fallen men. You say, I'm not as bad as that drunkard over there, so I'm a good person. I'm not as mean to my wife as that guy is, so I am a good person. I don't use drugs like that person over there. Uh, so I'm a good person. You're measuring yourself by fallen men. But the measurement you must measure yourself by to see if you're worthy to get into heaven is God. Amen. That's why Jesus said there's none good but God. Huh? That's why it says in Romans chapter 3, there's none good. No, not one. You're not good. You've got an eye problem if you think that you are good enough to get into heaven. Or if you think you're even a good person because our righteousnesses are as filthy rags before we're saved. I go to church, some might say. Going to church ain't going to get you saved. It ain't going to do it. I mean, you might come to church and hear the Word of God, then the Word of God pricks your heart. And you call upon the name of the Lord and get saved. It's good to be in church, but going to church doesn't save you. You go to church because you are saved. You go to church to hear the message to be saved. Going to church won't save you anymore than going into a garage will make you a car. you got an eye problem. You say, I give to the poor. Well, that, that's good. But that won't save you. See, the eye, 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 eye. I did this. I done that. That's not going to save you. What matters is what Jesus did. What He did. So change that pronoun from I to He. He died on the cross for your sins. That's the only way you're going to get into heaven. It's by that sinless sacrifice of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago on Calvary. I tell you what, if you've got self-righteousness, if you think you're good enough to get there by your own works, God's going to cut you down may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but one of these days you're going to leave this world and you're going to lift up your eyes in hell being in torment because you cannot save yourself. I think about the Pharisee and the publican in Luke chapter 18. 
There's two men praying there. And one is praying this way. And this guy's a very religious person. He says, thank God. I thank you, God, I'm not like that man over there. I thank you, God, and like that man over there, I give tithes. I thank God that, 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 that I, I do this, I do that. Look, listen, listen to the pronouns he's using. What are they? I. I did this, I do that, I do that. Then there was another man praying. All he did do is beat his chest and say, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. Now he used the word me, but he's directing it towards the Savior. Have mercy upon me. And Jesus said, which one went down justified? It was the one who begged God for mercy because that's the only way we can be saved is through Him. To try to save yourself. That man, that Pharisee, Unless he came to the Lord Jesus Christ and realized his self-righteousness would not save him, he's been cut down now. He's in hell today. Some are more blatant. They say, I'll do what I want to do. I, I, I don't have to bow down to God. I don't need God. I tell you what, you can live uh, your life that way. But I got news for you. The cutting down will come. You may lift yourself up and you may think you're as tall as a cedar tree. But if you continue on rejecting God, He will cut you down. I think of the rich fool. He had a great harvest. And he said, look at my great harvest. i got much goods bestowed upon me. I'm going to tear down my barns. I'm going to build bigger barns. God said, thou fool. This day thy soul shall be required of thee. He got cut down, didn't he? He lifted himself up and said, Look at my harvest, look at my harvest. Man, I got it made. I'm going to live it up. Didn't have no regard of God. Didn't even think about God. But he was reminded the moment he was cut down. That's a sad thing to be cut down by God. I think of this image, it's all throughout the Scriptures. It says in one place, where the tree falleth there it shall lie. If it's cut down in unbelief, it'll lay there forever in hell in unbelief. Saints too have eye problems. Amen? Now, we need to take our example from the Apostle Paul, don't we? I think he's a good place to look for an example. I mean, most Christians, a lot of Christians, they're just so self-centered, just like the world. I mean, I, I think that's our old nature. When you let the old nature get control, you only think about yourself and what's best for you. But that's not the way it ought to be. Right. The Apostle Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Amen. Huh? That's a lot different than the world's philosophy, isn't it? Right. I'm going to do it my way. Huh? If it makes me happy, it's fine. No, that's not the biblical philosophy. That's not what the Bible teaches. For me to live is Christ. Amen. The Apostle Paul, he used the word I, but listen to the way he used it. He said, I die daily. Amen. A better example though than Paul is the example of Christ, correct? Greatest of all examples. In Philippians uh, 2, uh, uh, 3, it says, Let nothing be done through strife nor vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. Amen. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robber to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of of men being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross Amen. Christ himself serves as our supreme example he came down from heaven not for himself did he he came down from heaven for us he didn't have to come down from heaven but he did he didn't have to die did he do you think the Romans overpowered Christ and crucified Him? That's silly. The one who spoke the world into existence did not get strong-armed by the Romans. 
How many times did Christ set the Jewish leaders on their head in intellect and wisdom over and over again? It wasn't them that really condemned Him. No, He gave Himself. He gave Himself on Calvary. He humbled Himself for you. Who are you to be lifted up with pride? Let's get to the last part of this application. We see the punishment. When God cuts you down, certain things are going to happen. Now, if you're an unbeliever, when you're cut down, I'm talking about when you leave this world without Him, you lift up your eyes in hell. No matter how high and mighty you are here on earth and how renowned you may be among mortal men, if you die without Christ, it is hell for you. Doesn't matter what all you did. If you didn't accept what He did, you lift up your eyes in hell. The Pharisees and the Sadducees thought themselves to be spiritual cedars uh, high uh, uh, up into the, the clouds. But listen to what Romans chapter 10 verses 1 through 3 said about them. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for Israel that they might be saved. For I bear them record they have the zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. They thought they could establish their own righteousness, but they couldn't do it. They were dependent on what they did. So now those folks are in hell today. God's cut them down. John the Baptist, looking at a group of these religious people in Matthew chapter 3, verse 10, he says, And now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. I'm telling you, we need to understand how bad hellfire is. Do you know Jesus preached more about hell than He did about heaven? I can't understand why preachers won't preach on hell. I can't understand when uh, preachers try to sugarcoat hell. It's the bad place. No! It's the place where the worm dieth not and the fires are not quenched. The smoke of their torment, it says in Revelation 14, ascendeth up forever and ever, speaking of the lake of fire. It's a horrible place. It's where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place of outer darkness. Why would you want to go there? Why would you not uh, come to the Savior as quickly as you possibly can? Why not come now and let me show you how to be saved? Before you cut down and it's too late. There's a cutting down of a Christian too as we close. Christian, you can get proud. That doesn't mean you'll lose your salvation. You cannot lose your salvation. Once it is, it, you are possessed of God, you're possessed of Him forever. But you can be cut down. Not cut down into hell. But cut down so you're, you have no effectiveness. Now we notice that God gave uh, instructions uh, about this tree when it's cut down. He said put a brass, a brass ring around it. That's to preserve it. That keeps it from fraying. Let the dew water it. He's planning on growing Nebuchadnezzar back out of this stump. Christian, he might cut you down to a stump, but you're not going to be gone. It's like Samson. Remember Samson? He disobeyed God. He, he followed after the, the flesh. His hair was cut off, but the roots still remained. Amen? You can be cut down. The roots will still be remaining for a Christian though. But you'll be chastised if you let pride enter in your life. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6 says, For whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son He receiveth. If you endure chastisement, God dealeth you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you endure chastisement, where of all partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. He's your Father. And as a Father, He's not going to let you get into trouble without correcting you. He's going to correct you, not because He's mad at you or He hates you. He wants to get you in the right way. You keep going that way, He says, get back here. You keep going that way, well, He takes out the chastening rod finally, and He wears your hind end out. 
Your spiritual hind end, by the way. He'll get your attention. Now think about this. I, I was just thinking about examples in the Bible. I mean, uh, there was a humbling of a believer in, in Saul. I believe Saul, King Saul was a, a believer. I really do. He did some despicable things. I believe he was a believer. But he surely did lose uh, his relationship with God so far as the aspects of fellowship. God quit talking to him. You know, Christian, if you get away from the Lord, and you backslide, you'll lose fellowship with God. He'll still be your father, but you're going to be separated from Him. You're going to be estranged from Him. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? Because all blessings flow from Him, don't they? And then if you continue on in sin, He'll treat you as David. On David, He broke out the rod itself. And David suffered some great things because of his sin. But then you have in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira. What happened to them? Well, God just took them home. Huh? You say, that's crazy. God will kill a Christian? Yeah, He will. You don't believe me? Believe the Bible. How about 1 Corinthians 5.5? 5, 5? It says, For deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. The flesh is destroyed, but the Spirit's not. That's a believer. Uh, in 1 John 5.16, it says, There is a sin unto death. I do not say you pray for it. Ananias and Sapphira felt that one. Don't be so proud, Christian, that God has to cut you down. Whether it be chastisement, or whether it be uh, uh, leaving this world early, it pays but to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not saved, I beg you, come to Him uh, this very morning. Be saved before it's too late. Let's go to the Lord in prayer.